Beautiful there. There's that too. So turn this down. We are live on Facebook. We are back with the International Archery Institute Archery Coach Cast. Um, I am your sort of host that can't talk completely yet because as you can see in the goofy swelling in my cheeks, I want to blame it on the virtual background, Dick, but you can see I'm still lopsided with my four wisdom teeth. Doc was was kidding that they tried to chain my mouth shut with logging chains, but that didn't work. You're right. <laughs> it did not. Um, well, welcome back to the Archie Coach Cast, everyone. I am excited for this episode, and I am excited because my, um, I would say, a guy that came out of nowhere although i've known of who he was for a long time i had an opportunity to spend some really quality time with him at the dick tone and j bar seminar at lancaster archery academy here a few weeks ago coach dick tone dick welcome to the podcast good to be here um you know i took a two-day seminar with this gentleman and worked with j bars who was on the podcast here a few weeks ago and you know I ha it was an eye-opening experience for me. As some of you know, you know, I uh, really was putting forth uh, as much effort in the transformation of NTS to Barebo over the last six, eight months or so. And I was having some low back issues or I, actually not low back, I would say uh, in the lower rhomboid trapezius area. And it's just driving me up a wall. I went, I got to work with Dick a little bit one-on-one, -on -one, got some review, and um, I will tell you that that stuff has gone away. Um, Dick's approach to teaching recurve archery is just extremely adaptable to, to all, just, just the whole process around it. There's so much value to it, to compound shooters as well, the process, the way he teaches the seminars. So I would reckon, I really recommend looking forward to taking his seminars, but uh, we got Larry Wise, we got Doc McCune, um, and how are you guys? L Larry, how are those twins? Uh, twins are doing great. We got to hold them for a couple of hours last night, Exciting. pushed them in the buggy for a while. So uh, yeah, they're two weeks old now as of last night, um, but still, you know, premature, but uh, doing, doing well, we're really happy. <laughs> yeah. Grandkids, grandkids, huh? Yes, my my son and his wife had that's their first, and it turned out to be twins. <laughs> so uh, it has family. been exciting, and believe me, they both have bows and arrows already. There you go. <laughs> Multi generational archery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you just mentioned that, didn't you? <laughs> yep. Yeah. How about it, Doc? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Finer than frog hair. All right. Don't make me laugh, Doc. It hurts. It hurts my cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, um, Dick, we're, we, you know, we talked a little bit beforehand. We're going to get into some mental game discussion with Larry and, you know, toward the toward the latter part of this. Um, but I, I really want to open up with you have you have an extremely um, impressive coaching resume um dating back to coaching the olympics coaching multiple olympic champions and you know we obviously and if people haven't been watching the olympic trials if they haven't been watching what's going on you know we have qualified the first six person roster for both three men three women in a while to go to the olympics um and you sir are the um coach of one young lady named Casey Coffold. Um, and I want you to talk about your journey as a coach. When I, I want to know, we want to know, you know, how this whole thing got started, who you've coached and, and then eventually get into your seminars and like, and how, what, what makes what you do a little bit different than what others are doing? Um, well, that's it. I, yeah, well, to start with, there's nothing new. And I think I say that in my seminar first thing is that it, there isn't anything new. The, the, the problem is that 
um, it, people get into coaching and they think they want to, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel. And, you know, the wheel's still around, nothing's changed. Our bodies haven't changed in a couple thousand years, as we just discussed earlier. We've gotten a little taller. That's about it. So the body only moves in certain ways. And, you know, and if you understand the physics of the shot and what actually happens with the bow and how it affects the body, uh, and you know, marry that with the biomechanics, which everybody talks about biomechanics. Well, it, it has to be married with the, the physics of the shot. And you put the two together, it's, it should be easy to shoot. You know, the body moves easily if you allow it to use leverage to shoot the shot. So that's, and it's not new at all. Um, I think you remember in the seminar where how I started is that there, there was a guy named Chester Say back in 1930 that wrote a book called Shooting the Longbow, the Relax Method. And he was the first guy to actually put physics to the shot. And he, and he had, you know, charts in there and he showed, you know, the, the lines of force and all that kind of stuff, things that are supposed to be revolutionary today. Well, that was in 1930. And, um, you know, back then everybody said, well, you can't shoot that way uh, because it's, it's not right. You got to be doing it this way. Um, and um, in 1960, a guy named Dave Keggy came along and he took everything that Chester Say had taught and, and he added some new stuff, uh, things like the open stance uh, and, you know, different things that fit what we do uh, with the modern equipment. And he taught his son, Dave Jr., to shoot. And he went down to um, Jones Beach for the national tournament, 16-year-old kid, shooting in the men's division, and beat them all. And, and they said, well, you, you can't shoot that way. He said, well, he just beat you. <laughs> you know? Why can't he shoot that way? Well, it's, it's not traditional. It's not this. It's not that. But that's the way the body works. And he called it power archery. And if you remember, Larry, I had I I, remember, I was a teenager. Well, uh -huh. 1960, I was 13. But yep. uh, the 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 men that I shot with, my dad and uh, other guys, uh, they got that book, and they get that was the only written thing that we had. And so you know, we looked to that to get things going. Well, I was, I was kind of about that same age, a little, little older when I was living in Canada, and I saw the book in Archery World, and I ordered a copy, and I got the copy in, and I thought, well, this kind of makes sense, and so I went out and practiced it. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than whatever else was teaching, you know, and, uh, and I shot up there for six years, you know, went from, you know, junior to intermediate to, to the adult, and um uh, I, I lost I lost one tournament, and that was because they didn't allow me to use a prism. <laughs> so I had to change my anchor and everything, and so I ended up second in that tournament. Um, and I left there uh, after shooting uh, the Canadian Nationals in 1964, and um, I, I won that. They had the, they had the target for two days, and they had a archery golf and clout, and then they had two days of field, and mm -hmm. they had a target champion, a field champion, overall champion. And I won all three by just a little under 400 points. So it was a close match. Yeah, there were several <laughs> records and stuff like that. But again, and, and the, the, the lady that, that won the men, the women's division was a lady named Joan Galley, who is now Joan McDonald, who coaches Olympic teams in Canada. And uh, she was one of the people I worked with to teach her how to do this. And the kid that won the intermediate that year, same thing, a guy named Brian Leonard. So that was kind of my start of coaching. And that was 1964. And I had myself and two national champions for my first effort. So it's a matter of interpretation. And you can look at Dave's stuff. And he also wrote a power archery too, which completely went the opposite direction. I don't know why he did that. But if you look at the power archery one and you interpret it correctly and look at what Chester Say wrote and put the two together, it's like, oh yeah, that's this is how it's supposed to be done. So that's how it all started. That's how it all started. 
And and then somewhere along the line, you um, you know, talking about your 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 athletes you've worked with, you come across athletes like Jay Bars, Justin Hewish. Now you are working with Casey Caulfield. So, you know, what what are some of the um, I want to say theories for you, but like what are some of the the prime um, things that you see with athletes that you teach that's different that seems to help or or affect them in a positive way more than shooters that aren't working with a coach or just aren't being able to get the job done. You know, I think the most the, 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 the most fun thing is when you work with somebody that's been shooting a while and they're struggling. And uh, I used to do this all the time. I have people come in the backyard and I'd watch them shoot a little bit. And I'd say, all right, I'm, I'm going to show you a few things. I'd write some stuff on, on paper and show them what I wanted to do and everything. And I'd tell them, I said, now, sometime within this hour, you're going to tell me that this is easy. And they go, what do you mean? And I said, well, just remember I said that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And without question, I mean, within a half hour, 45 minutes, so like, they'll, they'll look at me and say, well, this is really easy. And I said, well, it's supposed to be easy. Yeah. It's not supposed to be hard, you know? Right. So that kind of the fun part of it for me. You, um, do you, I guess, how do you bring that out in them? Because that's, that's the, that's probably one of the things we talk about all the time on this podcast is that people forget how much fun archery is sometimes when they're competing at high levels they forget about the fun because they're so concentrated on they well i guess they're concentrated on trying to win as opposed to the process of getting the job done do you know what i mean yeah it, it it to to most everybody in any sport it's the outcome that's important you know it's it, and that's not what the important thing is because if you think about it, and in archery, if you think about it, uh, how many people are going to the Olympics? Yeah. Three men, three women, mm -hmm. right? If, that's it. That's it. So we, out of the thousands of people who shoot bows and arrows in this country, we have three men and three women. And it was close that we didn't have three men and three women, yeah. you know? So, and how many years have those people spent training and getting ready for this? And the people who didn't make it spent the same amount of time, right? So if you're not having fun doing it, you look at the results and then look at this. When you get done with the Olympics and you walk off the line, you say, all right, I'm done. I won a medal or I didn't win a medal, or whatever it is, what's next? What's next? And if it all had to do with you winning, right? There is no next you're done yep. right but if it has to do with enjoying the sport and being part of the sport then you can go on so that's the problem i see in in most people and the reason they don't have fun the reason they're not enjoying themselves so yeah they're, they're trying hard for the wrong reasons exactly yeah exactly put all, put all that time and effort in um I, 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 go ahead doc over the years that I really got back into archery, which is only about uh, 12 years ago, I'd been an archer since seven, and then I was off of doing all my, my medical teaching and stuff, and got back into it, and I started to realize almost the second day I started shooting a little kid's bow because I couldn't pull a big one. I, uh, I, I had that feeling again of enjoyment. You know, this, is, this makes me feel good. And I started shooting with others and everybody who shoots regularly, if you, if you just ask them a few questions, they will basically say, I shoot not for training for the tournament or getting ready for hunting season, but because it makes me feel good. And now I've tracked neurologically and biochemically what creates the make, makes me feel good feeling is if we do archery correctly, within the total, the natural system, inside and out, it will make you feel good because it solicits the endorphins and the serotonin in the brain and all this kind of stuff. You can't miss. Yep. 
And you're absolutely right. Yep. Absolutely right. So I, I shot when I first started shooting, um, at a very young age in in in, uh, in Arizona. And we we're just running around shooting cactus or whatever. You know, we we're just having fun. And the fun part remained when I moved to Canada uh, because I didn't know anything about target archery. All we knew is that when we took our bows and arrows and went across the street to the ravine, we were shooting the stumps or, you know, rabbits or whatever moved. We were just having fun. And we go down there and have fun all day long and shoot arrows. That's it. Yeah. All right. And it's not until I got into target archery up there that it's like, uh, well, this could be fun or it could not be fun. You know, so you have the choice then of, of either making it an enjoyable thing or making it work. Well, if wow. you try to work it too hard, it could it, it would not be fun. Yeah. Right, exactly. So let's talk about let's talk about um, the young Casey Koffel a little bit and about your right. your journey working with Casey. Um, had the pleasure, and I know you know obviously Doc and has frequented Lancaster and I've shot there and been friends with Rob for well since I was geez probably seven eight years old um you know and and then over the years have watched Casey and Connor grow up and it's pretty cool to see such a transformation in the last five years which is the five years that you've been working with Casey obviously well first of all congratulations on on just, just the having yet another athlete birth an Olympic appearance um, as a coach, number one. Number two, Casey, if you happen to see this, congratulations to you. We are all um, absolutely positively rooting for you and, and the entire team. Um, but let's, let's talk about, and we'll, this will kind of lead into what Larry's question is going to be. Let's talk about that transformation of, of Casey as a 12-year-old to Casey now as a 17-year-old. And, and if I do say so myself, like Casey's demeanor is totally different than some of the most experienced shooters that we see in any of those shoot offs. And it's very noticeable. And I think that's something that we like, let's talk to that point. How do you get a shooter in five years, youngest competitor on team to that point? Because there's, that's a huge, like, that's the journey that people who are just shooting day in and day out that go to just a regular tournament, they struggle to deal with. So let's talk to that point, Dick. Well, um, I guess the, 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 I guess I can tell you the story of how this all started first. Um, I've known Rob since he was a teenager and I've actually had him on teams that I coached the world field team in, in Italy and stuff like that. And he was a, a really, really good shooter. I mean, world class so you know it kind of runs in the family when you think of it that way right you, you've got to have some athletic ability and I was aware that Casey was shooting but you know, I'd never seen her shoot um, and um, I had a couple of people i had been working with I had a young lady named uh, Whitney Jensen and Whitney um, I started her about as soon as she was 12 about the same age as Casey I think Casey and her are about four or five months apart and uh, this young lady had never shot before. And I can show you some of the whole transformation of her. And um, uh, I started her out with a 10 pound bow. And we went through the progression of, you know, all the different bows and anchors and form and all that kind of stuff. And it was getting close to time to sign up for Vegas. Now this girl hadn't been shooting a year yet. And I told her, I says, if you can shoot 285 or better, on a 60 centimeter face. I says, I'll sign you up for the Cub Division in Vegas and you can go to Vegas. And she says, okay, well, she shoots a 288. So <laughs> we're gonna take her. Anyway, <clears throat> sign up for Vegas, I go to Vegas. And I got another young lady, a young man I took along. He's his second year in Vegas and I named Jackson Murish. Well, Casey was in, in, in the same division with Whitney and Whitney stood there and shot arrows didn't care about what she was scoring didn't care if she was winning or losing her get her pro, her whole goal was to shoot arrows correctly and she beat them all 
There was 89 girls in her division. That's her first big tournament. All right. Rob took note. And Jackson was in Connor's division. And he shot 292, 297 and ended up winning that division. And we were standing there standing with Rob and Rob was watching this. And he says, does that kid ever miss? And I says, not often. And I says, occasionally I'll miss the X. You know, I mean, literally 297. So, you know, this was fun, you know, and Rob looked at me and he says, okay, you need to come to our place and do a seminar. And I says, oh, Jesus, <laughs> I haven't done a seminar since the 80s when I worked with the teams and stuff like that. And it's just, well, put one together. We're going to do it. And then he set it up for the end of May. Well, I'm working with the Canadian teams at the time. And, um, and I, there was a guy on our, our team, or there was a high performance guy named Alan Bromps. It was really good with uh, PowerPoint and stuff like that. So I says, Alan, I says, help me out. I need to do a seminar. <laughs> Can you do me a PowerPoint? And he says, send me some content. And I said, all right. So I sent him a bunch of stuff. And uh, it was a month or two later, and we were in Medellin for the Continental Qualifier. And I, I said, so Alan, how's the, how's the PowerPoint coming? He says, well, I haven't really started. I said, well, I got to have it by the end of this month. And he goes, do you realize how much content you sent? And I said, no. And he says, you sent me 25,000 words. And I go, um, okay. So I'm having a hard time putting that in 25 slides. <laughs> and I says, well, we got a week here. Let's work on it. You know, <laughs> there you can. You Only can a thousand understand. words a slide. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, anyway, um, anyway, we worked on it for a full week and we got, a, you know, he taught me a little bit about PowerPoint and how I can adjust things. And, you know, cause I'm kind of a rookie at that kind of stuff. And, and I had two four and a half hour flights home from there. Uh, and, uh, and so I spent the whole time doing that, working on it and getting it right. And, and then I had a bunch of time at home. And at the end of May in 2016, my wife and I went to Lancaster and we did a, a, a seminar. And Casey was in the seminar and so was, was Connor. And we had 20 people. It took it took like three months to fill this seminar, you know, to get 20 people to sign up. And so we did our seminar and I worked a little bit extra with Casey and Connor. And, um, and that's kind of how it started with Casey. And uh, that next, that the same year at the nationals in August, in the Cub division, it was Casey and Whitney shooting against each other. Casey ended up first and Whitney ended up second. And she still hasn't forgiven me for helping Casey. So <laughs> just the way it sounds. <laughs> you know how women are, right? But they're good friends. They are. So anyway, that's how it started with her and, um, and Rob. Um, and then Rob, you know, found out that the, the seminar was fairly popular, wanted to do another one. So he put it online and that one took 12 minutes to fill. So <laughs> things have changed. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the one that I took, um, uh, I believe. And, you know, that was one that was rescheduled, I think, COVID too. I think it was an originally scheduled COVID thing happened and then got pushed back. And then, um, you know, and it was, it's just, it was, for the people who are watching this or that eventually listen to this, um, if you are a bare boat or Olympic recurve shooter, my advice to you is to take the seminar because it's not just, it's not just this, it's not a shooting form only type of seminar. It's, it's sort of like, a, it's a condensed version of multiple years of training that gives you an outline on how to approach your competitive archery. That's kind of the best way I can explain it. It's not just shooting form. It's not just mental approach. It's, a, it's like, how you arrange your life around trying to be a competitive shooter. Does that sound about right, Dick? That's about right. That's about right. And, and, and to be honest, it's just as good for compounds. We've had compounds yeah. in our seminar and I've worked a lot with compound shooters. There's no difference. Yeah. It's just yeah. still shooting bows and arrows. There is no difference. Right. Um, and I guess the, the thing we got to remember now is that Casey works with Heather 
quite a bit. I mean, I'm not at Lancaster all the time. Sure. So we got to give props to Heather for all she's done. And well, and just here, let me interject. So for those of you who don't know, Heather File, who is the head coach at Lancaster Archery Academy, she works at Lancaster full time. She is Casey's full time coach. Heather has helped me um, as a coach as well. When I developed, started my program, um, you know, had some some significant target panic uh, discussions with Heather over the years. Um, and then Brian Brady, who was also a coach there at the, at the Academy, um, both of which I consider um, friends and just like it, you see their interactions and there's like this level of calmness too, you know, and Heather, Heather is, if you see Casey shooting, typically Heather's not far behind or somewhere nearby in that, in that yeah. environment there. And that's a hustle and bustle environment over at Lancaster. So understand that Heather's not just, not just Casey's coach. She's got other responsibilities going on too, but just to give you guys an idea of who that is. Um, I have a ton of respect for all of them, uh, especially Heather. So but let's go ahead, Dick. Well, you know, Heather was an RA. She's a really good shooter. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just not like she doesn't know what she's doing. And, um, and it kind of started with Heather when um, I was at the hunting camp with uh, Rob at his place in Ohio and Heather was there with her fiance and uh, Rob had her bring her bow. And he says, I want you to work with Heather and kind of explain to her what you do. And I said, all right, so I will. So one afternoon we set up a target and she was out there with a the bow and I watched her shoot a few arrows. And they had Rob and several of the guys that were there. And I says, all right, turn to Rob and you guys. I says, you guys can go. Just leave. Come back here in 20 minutes. They did. They came back in 20 minutes. And Rob looked at her and said, oh, my God, what a difference. And Casey had a smile from ear to ear. She says, this is so easy. You know, and I said, it's supposed to be easy. You know, so from that point on, we've been I've been working with Rob and Heather and Brian Brady and the whole coaching staff there to make sure that they continue and know exactly what you're doing, right? So it's easy for her to work with Casey and say, okay, this is what's happened. And when she has questions, she sends me a video or she'll call me or text me and we'll go back and forth. And uh, she's, she's just, she's so good at picking up things up and watching Casey and, and doing what she needs to do it keeps her on track. So it's kind of a team effort here, okay? It's the way it has to be because I'm not there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, and you do your own coaching out in Arizona, correct? I do. Matter of fact, I, I, I was on the range at 530 this morning. And mm-hmm. by the way, at quarter to five when I left the house, it was 90 degrees. Oh. That's why we're there at 530. Yeah. <laughs> Usually by 830, we're done, you know? Yeah. So, um. Larry, do you want to, you want to, let's have, let's have some of that discussion and talking about that mental side of things. Okay, good. Uh, great opportunity here to ask, ask an important question to me. Um, I, I like defining terms. And we hear the term mental toughness a lot. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what that means to people, but here's what I think it means. Mental toughness is the ability to engage and maintain present thinking despite the distractions or competitive atmosphere around you or despite the personal value you place on the moment. That's a good description because uh, I think the people who, who don't have that ability, um, they care more about what people think they're doing or they think people are watching them and they're actually not, you know? So they're, they're, they're letting outside influences affect them. And I think the people would, like you say, with mental toughness, they deal with the outside influences different, right? They don't let things bother them. Um, I guess, you know, the guy who said it the best was Hank Haney. You know who that is? Oh, he was, uh, he, he's golfing. He was Tiger Woods' coach. Yes. From for most of the time, he won majors, mm-hmm. and he said it the best: "Is says that uh, at archery or golf, in his case, is ninety percent mental, 
but that's only true when the other 10% is 100%. <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. what that basically means is that if you're confident in what you're doing in the way of your form, and you're strong enough to perform it all day long, right? And your equipment's right, and everything else is correct, right? Then yeah, it's 90% mental. Yeah. yeah. Up until yeah. then, it's not. I, I try to have that discussion with people a lot in the barebo side of things because you know I I've <laughs> tried to explain to people like sort of like what you just said, the foundation of the mental game is your confidence in your form, everything that's happening around you being in, in place. We talked about that a little bit at the seminar, you know, like um, if you're a kid having your homework done, having your job squared away, having your house squared away, having your bills paid, having uh, your hotel and reservations and everything before you travel to a tournament squared away. It's it, like when you have all of the stuff in line, it makes the ability to have a mental game. Um, it just, the transition to worrying about mental game, it's almost not a worry. It just falls into place because your confidence is just so high that you're prepared. You don't, you, like mental game almost isn't even a discussion. Like it is, but it's not. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. And, and I get this all the time. And Larry, you'll understand this is that, that when people come to me and say, oh, I want to make the Olympic team, or I want to do this, or I want to win the world championship, or I want to win the state championship, or whatever, what can I do? What do I have to do? Well, I'll take out a yellow pad of paper, and the first thing, I'll write down one thing. And the first thing is, get your life together. And they look at me like, what do you mean? And I says, well, if you want to be the best shooter, the shot is in the subconscious, not in the conscious. And I says, and the subconscious knows everything that goes on inside your mind and your body, all right? So if your life isn't together, it's going to know it. So get your life together. You can't have money problems. You can't have girlfriend problems. You can't have wife problems or both. You can't have any of that stuff. You can't worry that a bill isn't being play, paid. None of that. You'll shoot good, but you'll never shoot your best. You know. So that's kind of where it has to start. And I says, when you get your life together, come back and talk to me. <laughs> that's 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 priceless and it's it's not just somebody pursuing like olympic dreams i mean that's that's anything in life if you seriously are making a run at trying to do something on a professional um professional level and you're pursuing it i'll give you an example so right before i got my wisdom teeth out um you know like last year i did like some some diet stuff like a fasting thing and this year I was like, you know, I just want to go back to working out. And there's something called 75 hard and 75 hard is where you, you do like two workouts a day and you eat clean and you just kind of clean up instead of watching TV, I'm reading like a, a book, like a self-help book, a coaching book or something like that. You just, you realign the priorities in your life and remove no alcohol, no sugar, you know, eight hours of sleep. Like you realign those things. It's amazing how much more when you do those things and you clean that stuff up alone. And the reason I'm mentioning it is, is because it directly carries over to your archery performance. I start, <laughs> as soon as you clear that stuff up, and I know what I think about, Larry, I think about our discussion for you. I think it was Vegas, a Vegas discussion where you used to get up and run like a mile before, first thing in the morning before you would go and compete. Your body's awake. You're yeah. ready to go. You know, and I'm thinking like my day is better just by getting up and doing that first thing in the morning and exercising in the evening. If it's just a three mile walk or a two mile jog or a couple push ups, sit ups and air squats, whatever. It's just so much easier to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you clean all of that, that palette of stress. Performance is just so much easier to to uh, accomplish. Yeah. or doing anything else in life yeah. true right. yeah. i think okay, uh, i have a couple uh couple of uh skills well there, there are a lot of skills to building mental toughness all right so maybe you could point out uh a couple of you know we, we got to build the life skills build the life situation yes but what are maybe your top two or three skills that you think 
uh, an archer needs to have to, to build this mental toughness. And at what age, what skill level do you think we should start teaching this? Well, I, you know, mental toughness, a lot of it is, is uh, believing in yourself, all right? And if you have total belief in yourself, it's a lot easier to be mentally tough, if you will. Uh, it's a lot easier to handle pressure, and that's what we're talking about. Um, and I, I think the way to approach it, and it's, it's not something, I mean, it, you, you start right away. It's not, it's not an age-related thing. It starts from day one, um, and that is making sure that when you teach somebody to shoot a bow and arrow, right, that they are strong enough to handle the equipment they have. Most people are overbowed to start with, right? I know that sounds simple, but if you take somebody like I was working with Whitney there, I started her out with a 10-pound bow, 10 pounds. Teach her the form, teach her how to do things, and she could handle it, and she did it well, and she and it was not a problem, right? We did not go up in weight until she was totally confident in everything she could do, right? And by the time she got to where she was competing, and she'll she'll shoot in probably even less than twenty pounds, right? There wasn't any question in her mind that she wasn't confident enough to shoot and put him in the middle had nothing to do with bow weight or anything like that. She was confident in what she was doing, all right? So I think that's the first thing I would do is if in our picture that, you know, and I see it all the time is that coaches will push their kids to, well, you got to shoot a 40 pound bow or you got to shoot a, this bow or you got to shoot that bow. And, you know, as, as Frank will tell you and a lot of other people tell you they've shot bear bow, that's the first and biggest cause of target panic is that you can't handle the bow and it, it starts right there well right? And, and that in poor form i mean if you're if you're alignment if you're yeah. and at the, i get you get some pushback in some in some places but um you know if your alignment is crappy trying to stabilize the weight of the boat full draw with poor alignment makes target panic like you just all you're doing is it's like it's like mm -hmm. one of those little sponge animals that you drop into, drop into like a, a cup of water and it just keeps growing. The more water you add, the more it keeps growing. Well, if your form is like just horrendous, target panic just goes. Yep. And, and it, it, it happens the same with compound. And Larry and I have had this discussion a thousand times, you know, and, and it's if you're if you're not able to um, and, and Barbo, it just it just exasperates it because we don't get to use clickers. We don't get to use triggers of any kind um, and all that other stuff. And you have to be like super, super relaxed at full draw. Mm -hmm. And that means no tension. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and you're right there. Uh, and, and Larry, the, the other thing is that I think probably people miss is something we call tournament callus. All right. Um, and this, the, the way it was said to me um, kind of brought it to light. You, you know what it is, but you don't think about it that way. And I was at Vegas and I was standing back and I was, I was watching Jay shoot and, and he was, you know, and he goes to Vegas, shoots it every year. And one of the guys that was shooting with him says, hey, you, you, weren't you Olympic gold medalist? I said, yeah. And he said, well, how come you don't shoot any better? And he says, well, he says, I don't have any tournament callus anymore. And I said, well, that's a really good way of saying it. And I said, what that really means is that when you shoot and uh, do any sport, you build up calluses on your fingers and you build up calluses on your bow hand and, and whatever because of repetition, right? Well, you also build up those calluses on your brain, okay? And that is actually going to tournaments and getting used to the environment, getting used to the people around you and getting used to the expectations that are being put on you mentally um, and going through all that in tournaments. Because if you don't shoot tournaments, you're not gonna be good at shooting tournaments, right? So the more you do that, the more tournament callus you build up. And so it doesn't matter whether you've been the best in the world at one time or not. 
if you get if you quit, just like if you quit shooting bows and arrows, the calluses on your fingers go away, the callus on your bow hand go away and everything. And it takes you a while to build them back up. So if you go back to competitive archery, even though you won a thousand tournaments, it doesn't matter. You don't have that tournament callus and you will take time to get back into it. Mm. Right? And so that part of the mental toughness comes from tournament callus. I love it. That's good stuff. Doc, I know you, I know your brain. I can see the smoke coming from your ears. Here. Yeah. I know, I know you're, you're on board with that. I think these guys have been cheating and they've been reading about natural systems theory. <laughs> and it, Nobody knows it better a than you. A very good friend of mine who's now deceased. Uh, some people will know of him, uh, Colonel John Dramisi. He John was the longest residence, uh, resident of the Hanoi Hilton. And uh, <laughs> he, he went in there uh, as a, an already extremely disciplined person. And as Larry was talking about his mental toughness, it almost sounded like John Dermisi talking about discipline. And if, 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 if a person can train themselves to stick to a discipline, in, 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 in particular, a discipline that that works all part of the natural system of which we are a part and keep themselves disciplined to do that, realizing that we're only part of it. And our success is built on learning how to be, how, how to allow ourselves to be a part of it. Allow yourself to be part of shooting the bow, allow yourself to be part of, uh, of the shot because you, you cannot control the whole thing. It's impossible to control the whole thing. If you try, you're just going to screw it up and it won't work. And then you don't get that good feeling because the, the internal mechanisms in the brain that help us to connect with all these different forces aren't working properly. You know, the, the endorphins turn off, the serotonin sinks and so forth. You don't get the good feeling. Our, we are built to work within the entirety of this natural system and the bow has been paramount in that for a few hundred thousand years. It's been an instrument that teaches people how to become part of this whole thing. And, and from my point of view, what, I'm, not, I'm not a physician, but I've trained hundreds of them over the years in graduate training. And, and the ones that listened and, and were, didn't allow themselves to think they already knew everything there is to know about what's known, they heard something new and how to allow people to be well by, as you're saying, managing your life, going into life. If you don't do that, you're just helder skelder. And it's, it's, it's amazing people make it through a day for God's sakes, you know, yeah. it's just by the grace of God alone. Some aren't going to make it through today. And some aren't, yeah. Yeah. So and eventually, no, eventually none of us make it because we, we, yeah. we were born to die, but we're born to die healthy if we, if, we will, if we will work on it. And that's to me, that's a successful life, to die a healthy death. We're all going to go through it. You might as well be healthy when you get there, huh? And I'm saying that as a, my, I'm in my 82nd ride around the sun here, and I, I work at it every day. I don't always make it, you know, don't always make it. But more often than not, I do. So. Well, you got a few years on me, but not a lot. And so I can, I can relate for sure. Yep. So, Larry, the other thing that, that we teach in these seminars, and I work with my students on a lot, and I have for for eons, it seems like, is called rhythm and timing. And the reason I put the two things together is that, you know, if you, you just do timing, that gives you the time it takes to perform a function. But you can take somebody that's a, a piano player and have them play, play a piece on the piano in a certain period of time, and it'll sound okay. But if you take a concert pianist and put them on that piano and have them play the same piece in the same period of time, it sounds a whole lot better because they have the rhythm that goes with the timing. So you put the two together and it's the same in archery. You've got to have rhythm and timing. All right. 
and I've done, I've done quite a few articles for Bow International, and they had asked me to do an article several years ago, and I had just come back from Beijing, hadn't been on the international circuit for a long time. And so when I was there, I was observing, I wanted to know what had changed. And so they asked me to do an article, and I says, all right. So I, I had already had this started, and the article was called, What's Changed? And so I, I looked at the article, and I wrote down, and what the deal was is that our, 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 um, our rounds have changed. We're not shooting FIDAs anymore. We're shooting the 720 round. We're shooting set systems. We're doing all this different stuff. Some of the equipment's gotten better, but not that much, somewhat. So the scores have gone up. The scores have gone up mainly because people know they can do it now, kind of like Roger Bannister in the four minute mile. I mean, it's, it's, it's a psychological thing. So I looked at the whole thing and what hasn't changed? And I said, well, the thing that hasn't changed is the people who are winning now and the people who are winning back in, in, the, in the 90s and the people who were winning back in the 80s and the 70s, it didn't matter. They do all they do the same thing better than anybody else. And that's rhythm and timing. Mm -hmm. And without a cloud, without a doubt, the people who win have the best rhythm and timing, period. Right. So, you know, I've been teaching this stuff a long time and I, I work with the Canadian team. And one of the guys that worked with the Canadian team or was on the team, um, decided he was done with his competitive archery and he went wanted to become a coach. So in Canada, you have to go through four years of schooling uh, to be a coach, and then you can work on your specific sport, all right? And so one day I get a, 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 an email from this, this guy. He sends me an email and it says, uh, so what kind of wizard are you? And I got a kind of weird email, you know? And I thought, I don't know how to answer that, you know? And about five minutes later, he sent me an email. And he says, we were doing a class and this is a psychology class. And he says, he says, they gave us a technical paper to read. And doc, you've read probably lots of technical papers and they're a little bit difficult to read because of all the, the references on every line and every word and whatever. So you got to get through all that. And he sent me the technical paper. And that's called the importance of temporal structure and rhythm for optimum performance of motor skills, a new function for practitioners of sports psychology. So that's a mouthful. If you go through the whole paper and it took me several nights to read it, it says very simply that rhythm and timing done correctly cures all mental problems, period. Yeah, that's, I, uh, man, you, what you're talking about there is, is something that I've talked about. I know Doc and um, Larry know John Demmer. Dick, I know you know of John Demmer. Mm -hmm. And I've had this discussion with John numerous times. And we talk about that, like, it's the rhythm and timing thing in, in the Verbo side is even more important. But in all of archery in general, it's, the repeatability of that rhythm and timing yeah. is, is where the, is the, the keynote thing. Like you have to have it down to a science, the ability to do it over and over and over again. If you watch the people I work with when they're on, right, they're usually the first ones off the line, not because they're trying to shoot fast, but because they keep that rhythm and timing going and there's no wasted motion. And there's no stop. Everything is in motion the whole time. I think you remember the, the video we showed at the at the uh, seminar of the Korean lady. Yeah. Is that you? Is that you, Dick? All right. And how she didn't stop. She just kept moving, but she wasn't in a hurry. Let let that let that. That's gone. All right. Yeah, so people can hear you. I don't want. I want them to be able to hear what you're saying. Anyway, it, it, this this Korean lady was. And it was at the uh, at the World Cup in Salt Lake City, and it was her first six arrows for the tournament. Now the the, the field in Salt Lake City can be really windy, and it was windy, and she shot six arrows with perfect rhythm and timing, 
and walked off the line and she had two minutes and 15 seconds left on the clock, right? And she shot a 60. And then she went on to beat all the men. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> anyway, she went on to beat all the men on the field and, you know, shot 686 or something stupid like that. It was just unbelievable. It's all done in rhythm and timing. Okay. And this is something that, that we worked on hard. And, you know, when you were talking to Jay and he was telling about when he won the gold medal, all mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. His last three arrows for, at 90 meters, he had a one point lead. He mm -hmm. shot those in 33 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did talk about that. Yeah. And he walked up and he says, uh, well, and I said, well, I think you got it. He says, could you be more specific? And I says, I would be, but the Korean has only shot one arrow. So guess who learned how to shoot quicker after that? Yeah. And learn their rhythm and time and everything. I mean, it's, it's amazing, you know, how it works. But I've done this a lot of at camps in the 80s and 90s. And I'm telling you, the people who do it, they're the best. Yep. And I, that's, I mean, I guess the, and this is, this is, this is going to be a, a, probably a follow-up uh, episode question, but the next question I imagine for people is going to be, and we don't have to get into it now because it's going to be a lengthy one because I know Larry will have a ton of, of, of feedback for this, but people are going to say, well, how do I develop a rhythm and timing? That's, that's the lo next logical question is how do I develop it? And you know, that's where coaches come into play to help you establish a program that helps you develop the rhythm and timing, um, which I'm sure is what somewhat of what you spent the last five years developing with Casey. And especially in this last year or two, well, well, let lead up to Olympics, Olympics postponed, do it all over again. So. And you can see the, the mental part creep into it when their rhythm and timing slows down and stops. All right. So, you know, when we were in Salt Lake watching Casey and Jay was there quite a bit and, you know, trying to get her, you know, drag her across the finish line, if you will, you know, because mentally it's tough. I don't care who you are, but when you're a 17 year old girl, it's tougher. All right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there were times during the trials where she would get into things that were not good for her mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you know, Jay, he can keep things light, right? He can, he come back, you know, she came back and was talking to us a little bit and he was standing there going. And she looked at him like, what are you talking about, right? And he kept going. She says, okay, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Meaning this, the rhythm and timing. Mm -hmm. She's getting away from it, right? Mm -hmm. The minute she got back into it, everything went, came right back where it belongs right um the the problem with lot in, in in rhythm time it's really easy to do you know we we do a three arrow sequence because you're either going to shoot one arrow three arrows or six arrows all right so we do a three arrow sequence which makes it simple all right and once you start your motion you take your first arrow and put it on the bow once you start your first shot and put your bow you never stop your motion all right. From that point on, you put your bow down, you grab another arrow, put it on there, pick it up, shoot it, put it down, pick it up, shoot it, shoot it. So you're continually in your motion. Right. And as long as you're in your, your motion, you're trying to finish your sequence. Right. There's no mental thought about where they're going. You know where they're going. You're aware of it. You probably know it when you when it leaves your fingers on the string. All right. Mm -hmm. If you're a good shooter, you definitely know it. But by the time by the time you finish your sequence, all right, you know what's going on, right? You can make side adjustments, you can do all that kind of stuff, but you never stop your motion. When you stop motion, you start thinking. And when you start thinking, you think bad things. Okay. So we don't want to we don't want to think. We just want to let the subconscious and the body perform the shot, continuous motion. So, Outstanding. Uh, I um, some there's going to be some people that are really really going to appreciate and um, find some benefit 
in what you just described. Um, I don't, Larry or Doc, do you guys have any other uh, questions or comments? I got actually a few comments on our Facebook live feed that I want to try to address with Dick before we let him go. So you guys sure. have anything you want to add in? Oh, hundreds. Oh, I bet. I bet. About time. <laughs> now, Larry, we, we'll, we'll do we this again. This. Well, we'll yeah. definitely do it again. Yeah. We'll, we'll okay. definitely do a part two to this. Go ahead, Doc. Well, uh, it's just, uh, it, it's all, it's all there. Uh, so exactly what we've been talking about. It's what I've spent the last 15 years researching because I felt you, if you have that good feeling, it isn't something that just dropped out of the sky. There's reasons for it. And as I track those things back, it, 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 it tells the story physically, biochemically, and intentionally as to if we become part of this entire system and get with I mean, this almost sounds like some kind of quasi-religion, and I don't, you know, it isn't. I mean, th this is how we've been made. And I, I'm also a theologian, and I can say from the scriptures, from the original languages, it was intention, intentionality that made us this way. We, we Christians blame it on a fellow named God, you know. And it, if we allow ourselves to work with it, then it'll work better and we will work better. We work against this, it'll grind you up. <laughs> it's bigger than you are, it'll grind you up. Yeah, yeah. you're right, you're right yeah. doctor. And I see a lot of people trying to shoot in, in ways that don't work with the body. And it's so frustrating to watch it because the people are so angry and they, they get hurt and it's just not fun. Yeah. yeah, I know, we see their comments online. They are very angry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, that's a whole other topic too. Um, so I have one comment here from Matt Zernzak. Matt is a friend of mine. He's the host, um, one of the hosts from the push podcast. It's a, a big traditional archery hunting They're They're more hunting and, and, and stuff than target archery, but they definitely include target archery. And Matt, I know is shooting, um, outdoor target nationals for the first time this year are you going to be there by the way dick i should be at target nationals yeah okay. well i'll have to try to introduce you um and matt said how critical is positive affirmations or visual visualization in one's training regime i know the answer to this but please <laughs> go ahead because it's going to come better from you well, visualization and self act and in, in, in the well, in, in the last one, when you talked to Jay, he talked about the three by five cards and all that kind of stuff. And, and all that stuff works. All right. Um, the problem I see in the end, it depends on the sport. All right. If you are going to visualize or rehearse a shot and you're playing golf, you have plenty of time to do that. All right. And if you watch golfers, they'll, they'll go through a routine. Well, they'll stand behind the ball and they'll do this. And they'll do that. Again, they never stop motion. All right. And then we walk up to the ball and they're looking at this and they're, they've gone through the visualization process. The problem with archery is that if you do that on every single shot, right, you start thinking. All right. You have to have a sequence. So you you can do your visualization, your rehearsal and everything, but it's a rehearsal of the sequence. So if you do the rehearsal of the sequence and then just let your body do it, right, then it'll work. So it, it depends on what you're doing. Um, but that's how we do it or how I train in archery. So how about positive affirmations though, you know, and, and Jay talked about that in the seminar and I've talked about that. I talked to Jay about that one-on-one -on -one too of, of how important are they, not just in training, but as you're shooting? Well, yeah, it is very important as you're shooting. You, you, you have to have, well, I, I think that it, it, it goes back to what does the coach say to a shooter when they're on the line or when they're in a tournament, all right? And it has to be positive. Mm -hmm. It can be instructional, but it has to be positive. And when I work with somebody that's on the line uh, and shooting, uh, uh, you know, the last thing I say to them is always positive. So yeah. we may, he may come back and say, what the hell is going on? Why am I not doing this? And I said, well, you need to pick up your rhythm and timing, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. And I never say you're doing this wrong. Mm -hmm. It's always, 
you need to do this better or do that better and so on and so forth. And then before they'll leave, I'll make a comment that will be positive. So they're leaving with a positive thought and, a, and, and something to do mm -hmm. rather than a negative thought and I'm doing this wrong. Yeah. And I'll, I, I referred Matt to watch the Jay Bars episode because Jay talked about the three by five cards that that he did. And he mm -hmm. also talked about the visualization aspect where he was like, I shot those final six arrows thousands and thousands and thousands of times before I shot those actual six arrows mm -hmm. because I knew they were going in the middle before I even shot them. And yep. like you attested to. He was done in like 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and the Koreans didn't even shoot one or shot one. Right. Those, it's not, a, and it's not a matter of willing the arrows into the middle. It's a matter of he knew his process, he knew his rhythm and timing. He just banged him out. Boom, 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 done. He, he, shot, a, he shot a sequence. That's what he's decided to do. He was supposed to walk up through the sequence. Now, when he walked off the line, right, he would sit in his chair and put his headphones on and had his Walkman. Right. And, you know, a lot of people don't know what a Walkman is, but anyway, and he, he was playing Motley Crue and and he was rocking out to them and they called him the rock and roll archer. Yeah, that, right. was by, that was by design. Right. Because most people can't concentrate for a full four hours or whatever as you're on the field. And it's hard to even concentrate for a full six arrows. All right. So you have to learn to turn it off and then turn it back on. Mm -hmm. so that was how he turned it off and got away from archery and then he put his headphones down go up there and turn it back on shoot his three arrows and then he was done okay so it, again just a little mental trick there to keep you uh, moving forward rather than thinking negative yeah some people read books some people i shot with brady ellison at the classic in 2017 we shot side by side and um Brady would come back and play a game, play like a, a four wheel drive game on his phone. Like mm -hmm. he, was playing, he was playing a game, do to do, do to do. And, you know, and I didn't, I, we didn't talk about that directly because I kind of knew what was going on. I'm sitting there watching. I was like, archery was archery when he was on the line. When he came off yep. the line, it was done. Exactly. And, and that's probably one of the biggest struggles for people who are trying to be competitors, you know, yep. for sure. Um, I had one more comment. Um, Uh, let's see here. I think that's the only other one. I great, great discussion. Doc sounds a bit. Of, oh, um, no. Oh, <laughs> some just some questions or some comments about some people still use CDs. <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh. It hurts, Timo. Um, at the right time, begin work on timing. Just some comments, no other questions in regards to what you're teaching. Um, but I, I guess I guess that's that's about it for for this episode. I can't we talked about quickly and we're a little over our normal timeline, 45 minutes, but um, you know, I can't I can't thank you enough for coming on. I, I definitely think there's going to be a a part two uh to this or probably a further discussion. What do you think, Larry? Oh, part three, four, five, six. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll yeah. definitely definitely need to uh, definitely have to organize that and and where can people find you and what kind of coaching are you open to right now, Dick? Because there may be people that will watch this um, and want to um, maybe reach out to you for some help. Are you still are you taking clients right now? Yeah, you're gonna go to my website. That's uh, dicktonearchery.com. Okay, and um, it kind of explained everything. Yeah, and, uh, so we can do that. Yeah, because you do you do remote coaching as well as we um, do we, one yeah, on one we, in Arizona. Yeah, they can send videos, or we can do uh, a you know, uh, you know, FaceTime or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Well, we have to get together too because I want to do that form of, form analysis um, one on one with you with my my video and my feedback from your seminar so people can see what they actually get from the seminar and then like literally let you critique me and say here this is we can look at the changes and you can be completely honest because we made some major changes from the first day I walked in there to the last day I walked in there um you know and, and kind of talk about your your approach to that because it's it's that's pretty cool that little four-way camera system in it 
It, it is. It mm -hmm. definitely is. And for those of you everything. Who aren't, yep. aren't familiar, that Lancaster Archery Academy, they have a, a four-way system from above, from the sides, the coaching positions, the viewing positions that I do like form analysis from. And then Dick comes in and, and you know, they do one the first day that you walk in and they do as you leave and then com compare and contrast. And then Dick goes through and takes some stills and gives some 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 feedback, saying, you know, we have this that that has changed and is for the better. This still needs to be worked on, so on and so forth. So, um, but that's about it. I appreciate that. We'll talk about that later, Dick, and, and get together and let you uh, break me down. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, Doc, Larry, anything else before we uh, shut her down for the day? Oh, just just to thank to Dick for coming on and spending an hour with us. Uh, it's 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 great. Thank well, you. Good seeing you again. The same. The same. Good to see you. Sure we Look will. Forward to seeing you again. Yep. Outstanding. Um, well, Dick, thanks again for joining us. Everybody, make sure you go check out Dick Tone's uh, website. Uh, if you are interested in getting some instruction from Dick, reach out to him. Um, watch for his seminar. Hopefully they do another one here on the, the East Coast um, uh, in the near future. I might not attend, but I definitely will pop in, I think, just, just to go down and, and bust his chops a little bit. Um, and also watch for those of you, because we have a lot of followers from the West Coast as well. Um, watch for maybe a future one coming up out there somewhere. Any idea where that will that be in, in Utah again? We'd probably do it in Salt Lake again because of the facility. It's just, it's such a great facility to do it all. So. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. All right. Perfect. So watch, watch for that people. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is it for the live version. I'll be doing some edits and um, uploading it to YouTube and all of our podcast formats. Um, and that's about it. Have a great day, everyone. Dick, we'll thank see you. you. Thank hey, you. Yeah. Enjoyed thank it. You.